Today, we want to talk about uh, World War II and the events after World War II that have made such a difference in the formation of the principles of international human rights law. Uh, we said that there was a long, long history uh, of human rights, most of it, which we're going to look to our timeline on our Blackboard site to review. And we've only touched some of the major issues along the way of that history. But today, we're going to come to the period when international human rights law actually comes to be invented and accepted around the world. And so the story we want to talk about today is the story of, of how the United Nations was created and how the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was formulated and accepted uh, by the General Assembly and ultimately by the entire world. So let, let, let's start with our learning objectives today. We want to understand how the UN was created we want to examine some of the major human rights provisions in the UN Charter, which was adopted in 1945. We want to understand the United Nations bodies. What are the agencies within the United Nations that play a role in international human rights law? So we'll take a glimpse at some of those and we'll encounter those again throughout this course. And indeed, we'll encounter them on a regular basis as we read our newspapers and learn of what uh, is happening at the United Nations. Um, we, uh, I hope that after today you'll have a, a better appreciation uh, of the importance of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and how it has guided much of the, the subsequent development of international human rights law. Let, let's go to the United Nations itself. It was organized in 1945 after the end of uh, World War II, the work towards its development actually began uh, before the end of World War II. There were major conferences uh, in which the Allied nations participated. Allied nations began, in, began to call themselves during, during the war the United Nations. And this idea of the United Nations as an organization evolved. Remember, it's evolving against the backlog of the League of Nations, uh, which was form formulated uh, after the end of World War I at the, at the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. And, uh, and now in 1945, uh, despite the history of the uh, League of Nations, which was a sad and disappointing history, uh, nations came together following World War II to try again at an international organization. So we have uh, people have the nations coming together through their representatives meeting in San Francisco in 1945. I might insert parenthetically that this meeting occurred shortly after the discovery of a number of the camps in Germany that were used to imprison people, the concentration camps, where uh, large numbers of Jewish uh, German citizens, uh, Jews from other countries, a number of, of uh, people captured uh, in other countries, uh, particular brutality towards Slavs. Uh, uh, Russian prisoners were treated in a brutal way, but the concentration camps and the extermination camps had been discovered and pictures had been taken, and shortly uh, before the proceedings in San Francisco, a number of picture magazines, including a very popular magazine, Life magazine, at that time showed pictures of what had been found at these extermination camps. And so uh, that led the people who were working uh, on the United Nations project to begin to think more critically and more deeply about the importance of human rights. And so we begin to see the appearance of international human rights in the preamble to the UN Charter. We, the people of the United Nations, reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, and in the equal rights of men and women. Now remember uh, uh, what Hermann Goering said about equality. He said that that, that was against God's law, uh, that, that, uh, and that uh, the Nazi administration was not going to 
uh, pretend to uh, treat people equally. Indeed, it's quite clear through the Nuremberg Laws and other uh, steps taken by the Nazi regime that uh, they would not uh, treat even their own citizens uh, in a way that uh, gave them uh, equality. Uh, I'd like to pause and say that this is a wonderful statement in the UN Charter, um, but we now have major nations agreeing to this charter and think about what their practices were at the time. In the United States, uh, there was wide, widespread racial uh, segregation, uh, practices uh, uh, based on racial theories that were would be entirely unacceptable uh, to our times and to any principles of international human rights. Uh, the, uh, the Soviet uh, government was guilty of, of a terrible uh, instances of miscarriage of justice, show trials and other things. But here we have these two uh, large nations agreeing to the principles uh, of the UN. And at some point, the principles are going to arise again and, and help change these, these nations. I want you to notice, first of all, early in the Charter, that there's actually tension within the Charter itself. Uh, and in Article 1, uh, there uh, is a uh, statement saying uh, that among the purposes of the United Nations is to promote and encourage respect for human rights and for fundamental freedoms to all without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion. And shortly later, in Article 2, subsection 7, the uh, uh, United Nations Charter goes back and tips its hat uh, towards uh, the idea of sovereignty. And it says, nothing contained in the Charter shall authorize the United Nations to intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state. Now remember, Hermann Goring and a number of the defendants at, at Nuremberg took the position that what they were doing uh, in adopting laws discriminated against Jews uh, was that they were adopting laws, adopting laws and that were uh, valid in Germany and, the, and Germany had the right to adopt those laws because it had sovereignty. Um, and so the principle of sovereignty still remains in this UN Charter, but look at the tension between the ideas that we're going to promote and respect human rights uh, and we're going to have a sovereignty as, as well. Later in the Charter, we have Articles uh, 55 and 56. Article 55 uh, uh, provides that the UN, United, Nations shall, the United Nations shall promote universal respect for and obs observance of human rights. And Article 56 has the members pledge themselves to take joint and separate action in cooperation with the UN for the achievement of the purposes set forth in Article uh, 55. So uh, we now have the United Nations uh, in its preamble committing to uh, idea that it will uh, promote uh, human rights. We now have very specific articles saying that it's going to promote human rights. And in just a minute, we'll come back to another article uh, in uh, the UN Charter that actually leads us more directly down the path to achieve human rights. But let's first look at the institutions within the um, United Nations uh, uh, that are important to us as we consider uh, human rights. There's first of all the General Assembly, uh, all of the nations that uh, uh, joined the United Nations, which are overwhelmingly all the nations in the world uh, now are represented in the General Assembly. Uh, there is a Security Council, uh, which is uh, formed separately from the General Assembly. There are five members of the Security Council who have veto rights over Security Council action, and we'll see shortly why that's so important. But those five nations are basically nations that were victorious in World War, World War II, and when they formed the United Nations, they gave themselves a special position by holding on to this veto power in the Security Council. Uh, 
uh, much, much later, uh, I think 2006, we have the development of the Human Rights Council. And as you listen to this discussion about UN uh, agencies, don't get confused. The UN has a Human Rights Committee and it has a Human Rights Council. And you're going to find that these names are very easy to confuse, but the functions are quite different between the Human Rights Committee and the Human Rights Council. Human Rights Council we look at in a little bit more detail later uh, in this session, and uh, we'll come back uh, and examine uh, the Human Rights Committee when we look further at one of the treaties uh, that was adopted following the UN uh, Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, in 1993, uh, the UN uh, changed its uh, structure and developed a uh, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. And we'll go back and look at that also. If we were looking at all the uh, functions within the UN that uh, have dealt with human rights, we've, our list would be much longer. It would probably include also the High Commissioner for Refugees which is an important function with the UN, but these are the principal ones that we'll discuss today. The General Assembly, Security Council, Human Rights Council are very important to us. Um, we ought to say a few more words about the Human Rights Council. Um, it has 47 members and they're drawn from five different geographical areas. Uh, the, the African states have 13 uh, members, Asian states 13, uh, Eastern European states have uh, six, uh, the uh, Latin American and Caribbean states have, have eight, uh, the Western European uh, and um, other, uh, which means the United States and Canada, uh, has seven. So uh, this makes up the Human Rights Council, uh, which has a, as a mission to, uh, to look over the whole structure and, and program of the uh, United Nations relating to human rights. Leadership uh, for this body frequently comes from the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and there's very steady communication between the two of them. I'm not going to linger long now on the treaty bodies. Uh, these are organizations within the United Nations that are created by treaties. And you'll find that there are treaty bodies for most of the major human rights treaties uh, uh, that have been adopted uh, since World War II. Uh, but we'll come back and treat those in greater detail uh, next lecture when we're going to look at the UN treaties. Um, I want to mention before we leave the provisions of the UN Charter, uh, Chapter 7. Chapter 7 has been important uh, for our uh, story that we'll tell during, during this course because it, it now allows the, the Security Council to take action with respect to threats to the peace, breaches of peace, peace and acts of aggression. It was used despite the fact you will not find a mention of court anywhere in Article 7, it was used by the Security Council to adopt uh, statutes that established the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia uh, in 1993-94, and in 1994 to establish the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. So uh, Article 7 has been used in important ways, which we'll look at more as we get to the International Criminal Courts. I'd now like to go to uh, Article 68, which I said earlier becomes important to us. And the reason it becomes important to us is we now um, leading up to the development of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 68 says that the Economic and Social Council, the so-called Third Committee of the UN, when you, when you look at UN organizations, you're frequently hear people talk about the General Assembly, the Security Council, 
And then the third committee is the Economic and Social Council. And it is directed to set up commissions, uh, including a commission for the promotion of human rights. So uh, UN Charter, Article 68, starts us off. And it says that uh, the Economic and Social Council will uh, develop, uh, a pro uh, have a commission to uh, uh, further follow uh, human rights. It is important that a member of this uh, Economic and Social Council was Eleanor Roosevelt, one of the wonderful characters of American history, uh, the wife of President Franklin Roosevelt, who you remember began talking about uh, human rights uh, quite early, uh, giving his famous Four Freedom speech, uh, which we're going to see again in just a minute. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, being a woman delegate appointed by Harry Truman, uh, arrives at the UN. She's very well known, one of the best known people in the world, maybe the best known woman in the world. Uh, she was not only the wife of President Franklin Roosevelt, but she was a columnist. Her, her column in the in daily newspapers was just published throughout uh, the United States and, and other papers abroad uh, was read widely. And so uh, she had her own power base uh, based on her own contributions. So she was very much the modern woman. She arrives at the UN and, and you have to ask yourself the question, where do you put somebody uh, like Eleanor Roosevelt? Well, you put her over in the Economic and Social Council where she's not, you can't create too much trouble. Well, look what happened out of that decision. Eleanor Roosevelt becomes the, the chair of the commission that looks at the drafting of what turns out to be the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It didn't start out that way. The task was to draft the human rights treaties. And they began uh, that, uh, that function, and immediately they ran into the, the disputes about the content. What should the focus be of a United Nations treaty? Um, our treaties. Um, and you had two major positions on this. One by uh, the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc countries that believed that uh, economic uh, and social uh, rights should, be, should take the lead. Uh, after all, it was argued, why does a hungry man care whether he has free speech or not? What he really cares about is whether he can feed himself and his family. And so uh, this block uh, favored uh, economic rights over uh, what many scholars talk about as first generation rights, the right to free speech, the right to assemble, uh, the right to vote for your representatives, th those uh, first generation rights. And they were favored by uh, the United States, the United Kingdom, and most of the uh, countries that, grew, that came out of the uh, British colonial tradition. There were disputes over enforcement. Australia, in particular, wanted to see uh, a, not only the adoption of treaty, but wanted to have an enforcement mechanism present. And so, as we'll see in a moment, we now get not a treaty, but we get a declaration and we do not get, at this stage, any enforcement mechanism. Um, as they began their work, uh, they did something really amazing and really interesting. They, they decided to survey uh, important political leaders and religious leaders and philosophers throughout the, throughout the world. One of the people uh, who was interviewed uh, was, uh, was a remarkable Indian leader Gandhi, who uh, contributed to their study. And the study was to ask these leaders what concept they had of international human rights. What were the principles important to each of these traditions? And they were very eager to make sure that they uh, had contact with Chinese, uh, Japanese, even uh, Indian, European, Latin American scholars, uh, religious leaders and others, and they compiled a great 
list of, of human rights, and they found, I th and I think you may have been amazed at this, they found that there were certain things that were just common to every, uh, every nation and every, and every tradition. Uh, you shall not kill it was something that everyone thought was a principle that ought to be embodied uh, in a uh, document relating to international human rights. And so they began and, and had uh, a number of drafts. They had a wonderful Canadian lawyer named John Humphrey who uh, uh, did much of the hard work of, of drafting the documents. And as they got fairly far along, uh, they uh, came into a, a draft that uh, uh, was prepared by Rene Kassan. Rene Kassan was one of the members of this com commission, uh, a very important member. He again has a very interesting history. Uh, he was, I think, half Jewish. Uh, he was a French law professor. He uh, uh, had been engaged in the French resistance, but he fled France at some point. He shows up in London and he uh, calls on Charles de Gaulle, who is leading uh, the Free French based in London, uh, and says to de Gaulle, uh, I'd like to help in some way, but I'm only a lawyer. I don't know if there's anything I can do for you because you're engaged in developing uh, the, the Free French forces. Uh, and um, de Gaulle said, the very person I need is I need a lawyer. I'm having to deal with all these allies, uh, the British and the Americans, and they're difficult to get along with. And what I need is somebody to help guide me through uh, the negotiations with, uh, with the British and the Americans. And so René Kassan uh, becomes an important figure and remains in Stein, a very important figure, uh, uh, even well after the war. But uh, he now receives an appointment uh, from the French to, to be a French representative to the United Nations, and he winds up on Eleanor Roosevelt's commission. Now, uh, René Cassan uh, grew up in the uh, tradition of Napoleonic law. Remember, uh, Napoleon fashioned the Napoleonic Code, which stated the principles of law uh, in, in a document where you could go to. You, you, you did not, like in British and Britain and British uh, territories, rely on, on common law. You actually went to a document and you found the law printed there. Uh, Napoleon didn't trust judges. Uh, he wanted to make sure that the laws were written down and that judges could not depart from that law. At least that was the concept. And so we get these Napoleonic codes and adaptions of Napoleonic codes throughout Europe. And the draftsmanship of these documents is done in ways that is very precise, particularly when compared to the sloppiness of we common lawyers. Uh, we common lawyers uh, look to what judges have decided, and we get our law by looking at, at precedent. Of course, this is no longer entirely true. Uh, there's been a great merger between common law and so-called civil law, Napoleonic uh, code law, uh, and part of that merger has been very much encouraged by the development of international human rights law, as we'll see uh, throughout this course. So, um, so uh, René Cassan has this concept of, of structure, and he, he sits down and drafts a document which has really much better structure than John Humphrey's draft. There's a wonderful uh, book uh, published by a, a, a person who's now a law professor at Harvard uh, entitled uh, The World Made New. And she draws the title from a prayer that uh, Eleanor Roosevelt frequently gave. And uh, it describes uh, the development of the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And she uh, incorporates uh, in her book uh, 
Rene Cassan's uh, beautiful structure, and she uh, uh, she emphasizes the importance of, of Cassan coming up with this enduring structure for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And so, uh, uh, as you look at at the Universal Declaration itself, and I hope you'll uh, take out or pull up on your computer a copy of the Universal Declaration and examine it closely. Uh, first of all, uh, there's a, a preamble that gives us uh, the reasons for adopting the Declaration. And I hope you look at those closely. Whereas the recognition of inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is a foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Now, look at those words, inalienable rights. Where have we seen those before? Declaration of Independence. Uh, you begin to see a repetition of, of ideas we've seen uh, in the past. The, the preamble goes on, whereas disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts, and we've seen that in the Nazi regime, which have outraged the conscience of mankind and the advent of a world in which human beings shall enjoy freedom of speech and belief and freedom from fear and war. Roosevelt's four great freedoms. Uh, and it goes on to say these have been proclaimed as the highest aspirations of the common people. Um, and so the preamble goes forward uh, and then we have the foundation uh, that Kassan has in his drawing. And the fa what is the foundation? It's dignity, liberty, equality, and brotherhood. Where does this idea of liberty, equality, and fraternity come from? That, again, uh, here, here's uh, the resonance of the, of the French Revolution and the principles that guided the French in the construction of their major doc documents. Um, it, uh, Kassan then has the, his, his four columns, and I, I urge you to, to pull out a, your copy of Universal Declaration and follow along as, as Kassan tells us about these, these four columns. He says that the first column is the rights of the individual, right to life, uh, the ban on slavery, prohibition of torture, and others. Uh, articles 12 to 17, the rights of the individual in civil and political society. And then third column, articles 18 to 21, spiritual, public, and political freedoms, such as freedom of religion and freedom of association. Uh, column four, articles 22 to 27, social, economic, and cultural rights. And then uh, Kassan, in his structure, puts on a pediment which holds the whole structure together. And this means that uh, the Universal Declaration recognizes the importance of duties, of limits, and of order. And so the last three sections of the uh, Declaration, in terms of Kassan's concept, provide us with uh, uh, something that are uh, really important and coherent in ways that the other drafts of the Declaration were not coherent. Now, when we got to the final vote of the, on the Universal Declaration by the General Assembly, it was unanimous. There's no nation that disagreed with this Universal Declaration. Um, Let's pause and think a little bit about the wisdom of this being a declaration. What if this had been a treaty? And think about what would have happened in the United States if you had had a treaty that said that, that everyone was to be treated equal. Do you think there was any chance in the world of this getting through the United States Senate, which is dominated by Southern senators? In an era when the four Brown versus Board of Education decision in the United States in 1954, so 
we're in, in an era now where the United States is engaged in practices which are entirely contrary to the principles laid out in the Universal Declaration. If it had been in a treaty, it would have gone the way of the League of Nations. It would have been defeated. Uh, but it was, it was now a declaration. Uh, and although it was unanimous, there were nations that abstained. The Soviet Union abstained, Czechoslovakia abstained, Poland and Belarus, and Ukraine. Again, uh, Soviet bloc countries uh, abstained. Uh, Yugoslavia abstained. South Africa abstained, probably uh, uh, for reasons that uh, might have motivated American uh, U.S. Uh, delegates to abstain. Saudi Arabia abstained because of the provisions that saying that, uh, that everyone was entitled uh, to their own religion and, and should not be required to, to change religions. And that, uh, um, uh, that was offensive to the Saudi uh, representatives. At the end of the day, um, in the commentary, the, um, the Soviet uh, ambassador, who was Andrei Vashinsky, a notorious, absolutely notorious uh, Soviet official who had been the person who, who led the show trials uh, uh, in the Soviet Union that led to the purges in the 1930s and 40s, um, decided that he would announce the, the Soviet position. And the Soviet position was the Universal Declaration was, quote, just a collection of pious phrases. And so uh, they, uh, he felt like there was no reason uh, to vote for it. Now we're going to see the impact of the Universal Declaration in several ways. Uh, one, it is a document that has been translated into all the world's languages. It's been used in teaching about human rights all over the world, in schools, at all levels, all over the world. It's a document that is extremely well known. And together with the first two treaties uh, that was, it were uh, major treaties that were adopted after the Universal Declaration, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, it constitutes the International Bill of Rights. So when you hear someone talking about the International Bill of Rights, you go to three documents to, to find that Bill of Rights. Universal Declaration itself and these two other treaties. Um, even though there was another UN treaty that was adopted before either of these two, Universal Declaration was adopted on December 10th of 1948 and the Convention Against Genocide was adopted on December 9th, the day before. But despite that, uh, it's these two other treaties that are much more comprehensive than the Genocide Treaty that incorporated with the Universal Declaration for us to call it the International Bill of Rights. If you, when we examine those two treaties, which we'll do next week, uh, we'll see that it's their provisions are, are tailored pretty directly from the Universal Declaration itself that we don't find much new in these treaties that was not already announced in the Declaration. So the Declaration becomes the, uh, the template, not only for this, uh, these two treaties, but also for other treaties uh, relating to human rights, both in the United Nations treaties and in the treaties adopted by various human rights regional organizations, which have become important. You also will find the Universal Declaration has served as a, a template for the adoption of, um, of bills of rights uh, in various countries. I'm pretty sure it's Romania that has as, as its preamble to its constitution the entire text of the Universal Bill of Rights. That's the beginning point for government. And you'll see similar uh, uh, instances where governments in formulating constitutions have, have actually pulled out concepts from the Universal Declaration and brought those in, into their organic law. So the Universal Declaration uh, was achieved by a wonderful group of people led by 
a quite marvelous woman. Uh, it, it achieved uh, a statement that was an important statement, even though Australia did not win and they, there was no enforcement mechanism, even though they were not able to offer up a treaty, they offered up something that turned out to be very, very important. And we'll see that importance as we begin to look at these other treaties uh, beginning next week.